When the Shonchan seized Ebudar by force, Matt devised a plan to escape the city, taking a few Aes Sedai with his group. But he was discovered by Tuon, the daughter of the Nine Moons, and her servant, Salukia, so he was forced to kidnap them, not to compromise the plan. To be safe from the Shonchan, he needed to be out of the Kingdom of Altara, so he took the Lugard's road, north, towards Morandi. However, at his passing through the town of Mardesin, he found out there were many Shantan parties ahead, looking for Tuon, intent on killing her, since High Lady Surath, who was secretly a dark friend, had been spreading false information, saying that Tuon was an imposter. Thus, Matt is forced to leave the main road to try and find an alternative way through the mountains into Mirandi. In spite of that, his best scout, Vanin, tells him the only other passage into the mountains was blocked by landslides. Moreover, the main passage through those mountains and the whole area around was teeming with Shonchan armies, not only meant to look for Tuon, but also blocking a possible attack from Andor or Mirandi. But at this moment, Matt's luck, or maybe his Taviran effect, sprang into action. In the forest, he was met by Captain Salmanis, Matt's second in command in the band of the Red Hand, leading 8,000 men of the band, nearly half of them crossbowmen and the rest horsemen. Putting all of his warfare knowledge to good use, Matt initiates his campaign using guerrilla tactics, raiding and ambushing the Shonchan as he finds them. The first engagement is a divided attack on two fronts. Banner General Raymond leads the storming of a nearby supply camp to get provisions, while Matt leads 2,000 crossbowmen to a spot where two forested hills sit next to a lesser country road, flanking it to north and south. Matt deploys his men on the slopes, where they stand hidden by the forest, arranged in one line on each hill to cover the widest possible front. There, they wait for two hours until Vanin rides in, announcing that 4,000 Shonchan lancers come at his heels. The Shonchan commander orders the column to halt, just between the band's lines, getting his troops placed in the perfect spot for Matt's plan. Again, probably due to his Taviran pull at work, Teslin, one of the Aes Sedai with the band, channels to form a ball of red light above the road, which serves two purposes, to give the signal for the crossbowmen to shoot and to distract the enemy for a second, making them more vulnerable. At that short distance, the heavy bolts caused massive casualties. The Shonchan commander orders to charge into the trees before there was time for a second volley, but he ignored that the band's crossbows were equipped with a new crank that allowed them to reload surprisingly quickly. Thus, a new wave of bolts hits the enemy before they can even reach the trees, killing enough of them, including the commander, to effectively end the fight. Matt proceeds to leave the battlefield through the far sides of the hills, not to let the very few survivors know how many men he has. This first encounter meant the loss of nearly the whole 4,000 strong army for the Shonchan, while Matt's side didn't suffer any casualties. But over the course of the next 10 days, the bands of the Red Hand would assault the Shonchan in four more major engagements, and more than 60 ambushes spread over a range of 300 miles, bordering the Zamana Mountains. There, Matt suffered the loss of 400 crossbowmen and 500 cavalrymen, although he was still able to achieve victory, for he made many Shonchan detachments pull back towards Evudar, afraid of Matt's band, since his use of Aludra's fireworks made them believe there were Ashaman in his lines. At this point, Forik Karid, the leader of the Death Watch Guard, the personal bodyguard of the Empress, was able to track the band down on the Malvite Narrows, a five-mile wide gap that constitutes the narrowest point within the mountain pass into Morandi. 
bringing 100 of his men and 20 Ogier soldiers. He asks Matt to hand over Tuon for him to deliver her safely to Ebudar. Surprisingly, Matt agrees, but at that very same moment, Vanin comes with the news that he spotted a 10,000 strong army on a nearby town, five miles to the west. To make matters worse, he states that the army, composed of Altarans, Taraboners and Amaticians sworn to the Shonchon, were promised a huge bounty of 100,000 gold crowns for Tuon's head. So they will desperately chase her off, no matter what. So, acting swiftly, Matt lets Karid take Tuon right away, but he borrows 19 Deathwatch Guard soldiers, 12 men and 7 Ogier, to make the enemy believe Tuon is within the band, luring them to him to give Karid time to escape. Matt makes Vanin take the Deathwatch soldiers to the town where the enemy army sits, to be seen by them so that they could be used as bait to bring them to his position where he deploys his forces behind a wall of wooden stakes, with a ditch a little ahead, that he left intentionally unfinished to make the enemy believe they were unprepared, so that they would charge after them without thinking. As Bannon makes his way back to camp, Matt learns the trick worked, since he can see the enemy horsemen appear through the edge of the forest. When they start moving forward, Matt orders the men to throw shovels away and form three ranks of 1,000 crossbowmen each behind the stakes, simulating a rushed end to the works on the ditch, while the banner of the Red Hand is unfurled and the gaps between the crossbowmen are filled by 50 slingmen loaded with illusorous explosives. Matt stays a little behind with Teslin, Erisina and Jolene, the three eyes that die that accompany the band, and the Death Watch guards that close up the rear. The Shonjun advance, spreading out to extend beyond the wall's edges, and when they begin to gallop, Aludra lights one of her fireworks, sending the signal for Captain Talmanis to lead his 4,000 mounted bowmen forward from his hiding place in the forest, behind the enemy troops. Thus, the Shonjun are locked between Hammer and Anvil. At shooting range, Matt orders fire, and the first volley of a thousand crossbow bolts hit the attackers. While the first rank load their crossbows, Matt orders the second rank to shoot, and another thousand bolts hit the target. The last rank follows, and immediately after, due to the new devices on the band's crossbows, the first line is ready to fire again. This fast pace allows them to deal massive casualties on the enemy, but at this point the Shonjan are close enough to start shooting their own arrows killing some of Matt's men and creating gaps in his lines. Nevertheless, shortly after the enemy's first volley, Salmanis closes distance with the enemy from the rear, and so gives the order to shoot at them from behind. Caught between two lines of arrows, the Shonjan lose cohesion, causing disarray in their lines. Many whirl around, with some charging with their lances against Salmanis, and others firing arrows back but most of them continue on towards Matt. When they are too close to keep the crossbowmen firing, the order is given to fall back into a square formation. Once the square formation is set, the slingmen begin to lose their explosives. However, even though Aludra's creations cause much damage, the enemy lines begin to envelope the crossbowmen. Salmanis keeps firing arrows from the rear but some of his horsemen are forced to defend themselves with swords from the charging enemies, and many fall on both sides. Talmanis left a gap in the center of his line to clear a path for anyone that decided to flee, but none of his enemies retreated, since all of them were focused on the bounty on Tuon's head. When the square was fully encircled, the Aes Sedai present truly began to feel in danger and so they were finally able to use the One Power as a weapon, hurling fireballs in three directions. Even though the shower of crossbow bolts, fireballs and Aludra's explosives didn't stop for a moment, the Shonchan troops kept coming, completely mad with the lust for gold, turning their charge into a slaughter. 
from which none of them survived. Even Matt himself was surprised to witness how every last one of his enemies kept trying to reach the prize, finding death instead. As a result, the death toll for the Shonchan troops was total, with the complete 10,000 men killed in the fighting, while the amount of casualties on the bands of the Red Hand rose to no more than a few hundred men. In the aftermath of the battle, the Death Watch Guard officers find the enemy commander's corpse, recognizing it as Elbar, High Lady Surath's subordinate. They automatically realize he was a traitor, acting under Surath's orders, since he perfectly knew the daughter of the Nine Moons, and therefore there was no chance that he actually thought Tuon to be an impostor. Thus, the Death Watch Guard sets course to Ebudar to bring Elbar's head to the palace as a warning that Surath is a traitor, while Matt is astonished to find that now, since he is married to Tuan, he has become a member of the highest nobility. As husband to the new empress, he acquired the title of Prince of the Ravens. Matt leaves the battlefield, doing the only thing he could, laughing until his sides ached. Concurrently, not far away from that place, Perrin was preparing himself on the onset of another battle. But that's a story for another time. More Wheel of Time battles are on the way, so be sure to subscribe not to miss them. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next video. ¡Vamos Argentina, carajo!